Hello and welcome. My name is Kevin Igo, Managing Director of Professional Fee Protection. I'm pleased to welcome you all today to our webinar on HMRC unannounced visits. Now, this is a series of webinars we run for our member funded and selected guests. Um, if anybody does have any suggestions for future webinars, please do let us know. We will be sending around a copy of the slides afterwards, so if anybody would like a copy, you, you, you will get them. Um, and also, I should let you know that you are muted so that only uh, Mark and myself can be heard by everybody, as obviously there are over a thousand uh, individuals logged on to listen to this today, so obviously we can't all speak at once, uh, which is just as well because I think Mark has an awful lot to say. Um, so, without any further ado, if I can introduce Mark Taylor, who's a partner and head of tax investigations and dispute resolution at Ozacops LLP. So Mark, perhaps if you can just introduce yourself a uh, about yourself. Yeah, thank you Kevin. Uh, good afternoon everyone. Uh, by way of background, I started at uh, Inland Revenue and then into HMRC as a six week holiday role. Uh, that transpired into a, a 20 year career. I'm proud of the fact that I served at every grade and worked myself up in the traditional sense up the ladder. I worked in some of the most prestigious offices such as Special Compliance Office and even some less prestigious ones such as the South London Business Centre in Croydon, no offence to anyone listening from Croydon, which is now the blueprint to the new super office that HMRC are, are forming nationwide. I also served in the Investigation Office which is HMRC's own internal affairs and some of my most interesting cases were actually not taxpayers but HMRC staff. I'm now head of, uh, as Kevin said, the Tax Investigation and Disputes Resolution team at Buzzacott. Really enjoying the role and it's uh, a firm that shares my own values. I'm looking forward today to sharing with the PFP members the internal thought process, processes, characteristics and uh, the behaviours of HMRC inspectors on this subject. Thanks Mark. So, at PFP, we are seeing an increasing number of the unannounced visits, which is really one of the drivers behind the webinar. We're lucky to have a, you know, an expert in the field with us. So, without any further ado, Mark, if I could hand over to you. Okay, picture the scene if you can. It's a normal Saturday in a West Hampstead restaurant bistro. Lunch shift of 50 covers, followed by an evening shift of 100 covers. Happy customers, staff, and a very happy owner. Following a 10-hour shift, the business owner leaves at 10 p.m., leaving his general manager to finish off for the evening. At 11 p.m., he's at home, relaxing with his girlfriend, enjoying a bottle of wine, and the phone rings. He's told that five HMRC officers wearing high-visibility jackets have turned up with what he is told a search warrant. So by the time he gets back to the restaurant, HMRC are searching and they're interviewing staff all in the presence of customers. They demand to see his cashing up procedures, they request passwords of, uh, to data download, his hard drive, and by the time HMRC left the premises it was 1.15 a.m. He daughter missed calls from his girlfriend and faced accusations from her when he got home about what, what he must be doing for HMRC to behave in the way that they have. Now this case actually led to minor adjustments to his self-assessment that were agreed after a 14-month process. Well, a early question from Andrew, thank you Andrew. Uh, is this a common, commonplace or just the extreme, this type of visit? Oh. I would love to say it's the extreme. Uh, unfortunately, if your business is in particular a, a cash trade, then it, this is becoming more and more common. Uh, it really started off becoming more common with the task forces, but now there are specialised units, and um, there's one in particular that I'll focus on later, whereby this is common practice and common procedure for them. And uh, Scott's just asked, is this a true case? I, I can tell you, Scott, it is a true it case. Is. And we have seen a number of them at PFP exactly like this. Whilst knowing HMRC's powers as well as a taxpayer's rights when HMRC uses its powers, it's key to understand how HMRC is actually exercising any power. Throughout this presentation and this synopsis, 
I'll draw on my knowledge and understanding of HMRC practices and provide an insight into what HMRC is actually doing. Finally, I'll provide some advice into what clients should do if unfortunately their number has come out of Lancelot and they are visited. Uh, as we said earlier, it's just to remind everybody, if anybody has any questions throughout, please send them in in the usual way. So why do HMRC do unannounced visits? Officially, the first uh, of the, uh, these are the three bullet points, and this is actually taken direct from HMRC's own compliance handbook manual. One, the first bullet point I get, it, it essentially deals with HMRC's frustrations of someone under inquiry who simply refuses to engage in the process. And when for, for I myself was serving in the Croydon local office, I saw many instances of individual taxpayers just not cooperating and not submitting records and there was a sense of what do we do about this to help to get them to engage uh, in the process. Penalty notices not working. The third bullet point is primarily to counter fraudulent activities such as MTEC. Going back to the second one, now this was initially designed for the hidden economy and it sort of makes sense where HMRC get, gets information that there's a, a trade or there's an activity that hasn't registered with HMRC, this gives HMRC the, the power to go and visit that and to catch them real time or visit them real time. But what's becoming more of a concern is HMRC reading this now as a way of, well, if you're a cash trade, the only way that we're going to catch you or, or, or witness an evidence that there are uh, misappropriations is by visiting, visiting you unannounced. I have a question from Laura. Do they need to be reasonably required still? The inspection can only take place, Kevin, if it is reasonably required to check a person's tax position. If the inspection would not affect a person's tax position now in the future, it's not reasonably required. So it's very similar to uh, a Schedule 36 information notice. Now. HMRC has to strike the right balance between putting the burden on someone facing an inspection and how important the inspection is on deciding the correct tax position. Okay, so what sort of questions should we be asking and when? Uh, I'll, that will be covered uh, later in. I've got a couple of questions can be asking you to clarify what's Lancelot. Sorry, uh, forgive me, Lancelot, uh, uh, my sense of humour, Lancelot is the, one of the uh, lottery, national lottery uh, uh, ball drawing machines and uh, it, it does feel a bit like that in terms of if you're, no, if you're unlucky enough for your number to come up, they will, they don't just work, HMRC doesn't just, they, they risk profile but they don't just work on a, on a, where they go out with a specific risk, sometimes literally your selection is random. Uh, quick question from Mirza. So all businesses with cash trade might be subject to these unannounced visits? Yes, in a nutshell. Presumably not just cash trades. Not just cash trades, but um, the particularly the instance that I gave uh, in terms of the picture, the, the picture, the scene. The whole purpose of calling at that sort of time is for cash, and it's to see the cashing up process and the cash handling live. Peter's queried, will they actually really be random? There are some random, and they're specifically random to justify uh, that they are not just specifically uh, targeting. Uh, obviously their risk profile analysis has improved over the years, but to be f fair to, or to be seen to be fair, they do do random selections. Okay, thank you. Now, unofficially, putting it simply, HMRC love unannounced visits. It, it, it's, uh, it's, um, it, it's quite clear that they, through their unannounced visits, they've identified cases uh, live of evasion, real time, and it has led to criminal uh, prosecutions. It allows them to flex their powers with results. Now, some HMRC staff, particularly some senior staff with uh, an HM customs and excise background, hold the view that 
this uh, exercising this power and using this power brings perhaps the, the former inland revenue staff into modern times and gets former inland revenue staff away from the practices of carrying out investigations just stuck behind their desks. It gets them out on the street, putting the word out that HMRC are prepared to check and they are prepared to visit people. When the powers are being uh, introduced, when the Schedule 36 Paragraph 10 powers were being introduced, HMRC said that the visits would be when they suspected higher risk or tax fraud and that it would be the exception, uh, not the norm. That there would be safeguards to prevent this. But the, the reality is, is that whilst this may have been the case uh, when the power was first were introduced, we're seeing more and more, uh, particularly cash trades, restaurants, fish and chip shops being visited at irregular hours, uh, all with the purpose of uh, examining cashing up procedures. So it's, uh, I have to say, the the safeguards in terms of pre in terms of preventing HMRC over use, over using its powers or potentially misusing its powers. I'm yet to evidence any real safeguarding. The in terms of premises, they're not allowed to enter a, a dwelling. Only the business uh, part of those premises. So it so for clients who work from home, uh, they should be uh, alive to the fact that HMRC are entitled to visit their home uh, and their business at home uh, and inspect at the areas within the home where the business is uh, undertaken. In terms of business assets, uh, HMRC is allowed to view uh, physical items that HMRC has reason to believe are owned, leased or used in connection with the carrying on of a business. It doesn't include assets such as uh, documents unless they are trading stock uh, or plant. The business documents, uh, the phrase business documents has a narrow meaning uh, and HMRC does extend this but ultimately it has to be documents that are that relate to the carrying on of business by a, a person and that form part of their statutory records. One of the things that we do commonly see uh, HMRC is HMRC's access to what would be described as old records, records that are over six years old, legally privileged material uh, and tax papers on continuing appeals that HMRC do on these visits do look at, which they're not entitled to. Okay, if we take a couple more questions, um, if the business isn't a cash trade, what would be the reasons for, for a visit? It would be, if it's um, if, it, if it's an unannounced visit without a compliance check, the first the first thing is uh, whether or not the it's been tribunal issued or it's been issued by an authorising officer. It, but ultimately, it would be that HMRC believes that by make by giving grounds or giving uh, notice of that visit, ultimately, either documents would be destroyed. Firstly, it believes that there's a risk and it's the right, it's proportionate to check the tax position. Secondly, they believe by giving notice, they would, there is the fear of either the uh, the visitor uh, being um, the, the, the business owner, either destroying records or obstructing the call. Okay. Um, will um, will HMRC undertake covert operations prior to a visit? Uh, they say they won't, but uh, they do. Yeah, we've we've certainly seen cases where they have. Uh, how can they reasonably justify uh, visits, random visits, as reasonably required? Because of the fact that uh, ultimately they want to check records uh, and they want to see the business in practice that they have taken as uh, I think they could. Visits are important. They're an important part of HMRC's process. I think going back to the original, some of the bullet points, if you've got somebody who is non-compliant and not engaging in a compliance check process, you can perhaps understand why HMRC do the visit. But it's ones in particular where people aren't under inquiry, they go out and do the visit, and essentially after the visit, then decide what they're going to do. Okay. What happens if the records are kept at the accountant's office? Uh, then the, the, the 
what would happen is they couldn't then go on. They would, uh, in an instance, it depends upon what time of day it was, but what generally would happen is they would pick up the phone, phone their authorising officer, and get verbal agreement then to go to the accountant's offices to inspect those records. Are the, are the unannounced visits more common for larger businesses where the potential return for HMRC is greater? Uh, no. Uh, no, I it, 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 the opposite. It, 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 uh, it, it is, but the, some of the, we, we are talking sole proprietors, uh, we're talking family run restaurants, uh, fish and chip shops for example, um, and in particular the ones, uh, I've seen instances where the fish and chip shops where you've got very young junior members behind the, the behind the counter serving to customers being interviewed so no it, it, it's the full range but the, the, the it, it's not done on the, on size are HMRC required to state the purpose or reason for the visit yes uh, which we will cover uh, uh, later on uh, uh, Mehmet has asked uh, if we move on here uh, my clients have turned away unannounced visits and the inspectors threatened to get a court order this was at midnight on a Friday night whilst in the pub, the client's obviously at home, yeah. uh, and I was not very kind to the inspector when speaking on the phone. The question is, can we complain if the inspector makes threats like this to the client? Uh, well, well, firstly, there's a good relationship there. If you've got a client who calls his accountant uh, and at that time, that, that is one of the key things. What If you've got an, un an unannounced visit, and the unannounced visit, we'll come on to this in the presentation, but an unannounced visit whereby it's issued by an authorising officer, um, the only and entry is refused, what, what HMRC has to do is then go to the tribunal to get uh, the unauthorised visit uh, approved there. But in every case that I've been involved with, Kevin, where we have said no to them going in, yeah. not one instance has HMRC then gone on to the tribunal to get that no, notice. That's our experience as well. We've never seen anybody find. Can they request copies of all information since the start-up period up to six years? Initially, I would uh, I would restrict. They, they've got the right to look at records for a specific period, but in terms of going back, definitely going back beyond six years, that is an immediate no. If when you go from a period of say uh, four years down uh, up to six years, obviously they can only assess for uh, in excess of four years where they believe somebody has been careless. So I think my my attitude has always been start with live and then build from there. So what are the spread of taxes looked at? What are the spread of taxes that are being looked at? It's not simply VAT. No, it, we are we are talking joint working. Uh, we've all, we've seen instances where so they go out with uh, with both, both disciplines, direct and indirect teams uh, that are now joint working together. So VAT uh, and income tax, uh, VAT corporation tax. We've even seen instances where the national minimum wage officers. Uh, are in the background as well. Thank you. Now, one of one of the key things about the the authorization of unannounced visits is essentially the is recognising instantly that who has actually issued this. Has it been issued by an authorised officer in HMRC? And the level and the degree of the authorised officers that are, that are issuing this are of what I would call a junior level in terms of uh, senior, seniority. Uh, we're not talking uh, going to an old-fashioned, say, inspector type level grade. We're talking uh, at a sort of a, a floor office sort of manager level. Uh, the also the the worrying one is about verbal where the verbal agreement is given and um, and when HMRC 
does actually decide to go to tribunal. Typically, they only go to tribunal if that they anticipate that they are going to immediately get direct obstruction so that the they consider that the tribunal approval gives them more weight. But ultimately, they're very confident that their officers and, and the, the process and the approach and, when, and the entry, the way that they train and the way that they they get their officers to behave in that initial five, ten minutes. We all say about first five minutes create an impression and they certainly are trained to do that so that it's almost along the lines of the, the whole issue of whether it's been issued by an authorised officer or the tribunal is just lost in the actual five minute flurry. Now, in terms of what HMRC must do when they visit, um, the the first, the first one. These are sort of the the five, uh, sorry, the six uh, key points that they must do. Um, the the first one is an interesting one because um, in the past, uh, and I use the word we here. Um, when I was at uh, HMRC, particular officers had particular warrant cards, and those warrant cards, some of those warrant cards actually had badges on them, and those badges. Uh, were pretty much look like Met Police uh, badges or uh, police officers' badges, and they carried huge weight and huge physical impact. To get, and the minute you showed that badge, you could see almost the colour drain from people. Now, a number of those badges have been withdrawn. So what HMRC does now to create uh, on in some instances is put they wear high visibility jackets and part of the reason and part of the justification for them doing that is for health and safety reasons of course it's got actually nothing whatsoever to do with intimidation or to create an impression on a, the other thing is that the ins the inspection notice you've got to be uh, pretty sharp when you look at it to, to realize that it isn't a search warrant because it looks like a search warrant the way it's drafted the, the just the, the, the visualness of it it looks like a search warrant one of the things that HMRC did do is they uh, to say cost they went from I don't know uh, they went from pure white to uh, a buff colored paper they actually like that for the for the sort of uh, the inspection notices because it gives them more of a legal document feel to it. They also bombard you with paperwork, so they give you fact sheet uh, FS4, uh, so that straight away you're, you're given a document that looks like a, it does, to all of intents and purposes, look like a search warrant, and it also you're just bombarded with information. The, they're taught to when they explain the reason for the visits. They're, they're told to take control, explain to them that you have powers uh, so that straight away people don't realize and don't appreciate that they can actually reject and, uh, and turn them away. The, the key one to handle is they are told that they, that, that, to tell people that they can call their agent but there is ways in how to skillfully handle that. For example, do I need my accountant here? HMRC officer who's been trained will turn around and say that's a matter for you to, to decide, but I don't need him here. I've come, if I needed your accountant, I would have gone to him. I don't need your accountant here. I need you here, uh, and I've come here because I want to learn and see how the business operates. Now, also they will say that we're, we're not, we don't have to de delay our inspection whilst your accountant uh, attends. If you do phone your accountant or do phone your agent, we don't have to delay things. But the reality is, is that a taxpayer is entitled not to allow access to the premises until his agent arrives. The issue you have is once you let them in and start let them and start the process, it's then that delay. And what are the consequences if the officer doesn't follow this procedure? It's a lot. I can say this from having spoken to people that have been on the receipt of this. When you talk them through this in terms of did they show this, did they show that, a lot of them are in a state of shock, Kevin. They, they, there is not something that they necessarily, have. there's no checklist that the HMRC has to give to say uh, and get a taxpayer to sign to say that I did this, do you accept I did that? So when you actually go through and explain this, did they tell you this? Some can't remember, 
some actually say no they didn't uh, what, uh, are, are adamant that they didn't and obviously uh, when you actually see the HMRC note of the inspection you can rest assured what the HMRC note, notice of the inspection does say. Yeah, now, when they explain it, another question uh, from David, when they explain the reasons for the visit uh, on that last slide, um, how vague can they be? I, can they simply say I'm checking your tax affairs? That's essentially what, what they do. They, uh, they say, uh, the way it comes across and the way that you deliver it is that you deliver it in terms of that you say that you have, because they do have various rights, but the reality is is they have to be allowed onto the premises to do their job. Okay, so when they have to explain the reasons, it's like a chocolate teapot. It is, yeah. It looks good, but it doesn't do an awful lot. Yeah, and uh, and it's all down to the way in which they deliver it. When you see them, uh, when you know how they deliver it, it's delivered in such a way, it's so officious that you just think, I've got no right here. Yeah, okay, thank you. Now, on the next slide, uh, here I've put what I call the, uh, the seven deadly sins in terms of what HMRC must not do. Um, now, in terms of one, uh, the, the person is made because of the way HMRC conduct themselves, the, the numbers of them, uh, sometimes just the sheer embarrassment of having HMRC come in when customers are there. People feel under pressure. Uh, the, the vast, vast majority of instances, people comply with unannounced visits because they don't understand or appreciate what their rights are. Now, HMRC, in my view, commonly fail on the, on the final five. Um, the in terms of conducting searches and interviewing uh, uh, persons, you know, I know of instances where they've interviewed junior members of staff. We're talking people below 16 year, years old or in around 16 years old uh, that they have that they get a, a permission to conduct a search. Can I look over there? Yes, and people comply. Um, the interesting one clearly is the is the cashing up is that HMRC actually hasn't got, uh, they can't require a customer to cash up. And this is something that I think is lost. What the, they, why do they go on these late night visits? Well, they go there because they want to witness cashing up. Now, if a customer or it is, is about to cash up or it's their no more process, then HMRC has the right to stay on the premises whilst they carry that out. But and one of the things that they skillfully do is they say here, do you, know, uh, do you normally cash up? Are you about to cash up? We come here to see you cash up. And without actually telling them that they can't require them to do that. Now, uh, also one of the things as well is that where we see mixed, uh, where businesses uh, working from home, the areas aren't segregated and HMRC uh, I'll give you an example. We had one where uh, it was a kit car business run from home, and HMRC turned up unannounced to see the kit cars. Well, the reality is, is the kit cars they were made off-site and the parts sent to customers. But that process allowed HMRC to get in, and the real reason of getting in that home was to look at the person's lifestyle and means. So having talked about some of the hours of which HMRC uh, attends, uh, what is a reasonable time? Now again, I've quoted here direct from HMRC's own instruction manual, and this is a manual that I regularly look at uh, and regularly qu quote and preach to HMRC because a lot of instances they don't follow it. Now, HMRC is regularly stretching the boundaries of reasonable time, arguing that a time of business uh, for say a, a restaurant or a bar at 6 to 11 at night is the same as a, an office 9 to 5 business uh, that they call it, uh, businesses at a close of play. Why? Well, predominantly uh, it's calculated to achieve access to maximize the sale records for that particular shift and also the information available and indirectly HMRC know that the business owner isn't fresh, they're not alert, they're tired, they've, they've just done a full day and again it, it sort of maximises, it gives the uh, the chances of HRC being turned away reduces 
and it also reinforces the impression in some respects that it's a search because the way the, it's exactly the way the criminal teams operate. When I was in charge of a criminal team, uh, a criminal investigation unit, we specifically went out, for example, where we suspected payroll issues. We would go out on payday and hit when it was payday and people were being paid because we wanted to inspect the, uh, the pay packets. And, that, and HMRC has sort of learned, their civil side has learned from the criminal in terms of how to maximise success. So that's one of the reasons why they do their late night uh, visits. Thanks. Uh, you mentioned um, they're not allowed to require customers to cash up or interview the person subject to the information address. Uh, a question from Peter, where is this laid out to quote to HMRC? Uh, it's in there, it, it's actually in the compliance handbook um, and uh, if, uh, if that particular uh, Question, question. Uh, wants to directly email me. I'll, okay. I'll specifically refer them to that. Okay. Well, actually, that may be something they can all, everyone can use. If yeah. We don't have that. We'll take yeah, sure. it with the slides. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, right. But sorry, Kevin, that is laid out in their own compliance yeah. handbook. And we know they all read that daily. Um, our HMRC applies to, obliged to provide notes of their initial visit to the taxpayer or agent. Uh, yes. You, you will. You cannot. Whether the fact that they um, they don't routinely, uh, and this is I think one of my bugbears. They go in, and then they literally say, "We will be in contact with you," and and then it's not a case of they they tell you what they find or what concerns they have. They ask numerous questions, uh, numerous uh, the, the searches, very extensive uh, and, and and quite, uh, dare I say, you know, inquisitive and intrusive, and then they get up and go. Once the visits occurred, and he's let them in, can the taxpayer refuse to answer specific questions and request them to be put in writing? Yes. Uh, an interesting question from NASA, if the taxpayer stands up for his rights and doesn't let them in, uh, to what extent can it hurt his or her interests in terms of dealing with HMRC? Um, it, it, in my experience, it, it doesn't. And I think that, uh, that it's a great question because that is the key. HMRC play on that um, you know, in terms of uh, uh, can you explain to me, sir, why you, why you don't wish to cooperate with us? And it, they put great pressure on, but the reality is that it has, in my experience, by rejecting and uh, and turning them away, and I will give good reasons for that later on. Um, there is, n I have seen no uh, impact at all, uh, or to a detrimental point. Simon's pointed out on one visit, one of his clients had HMRC asked to count the cash in the owner's pockets. Well, there you go. Uh, I mean, the, the where I quoted those seven deadly sins, they're all com they're all com because of the, the the slides. Every single one of those the seven what I call the seven deadly sins is in their compliance handbook. Yeah. Okay. So they're, all, they're telling them that they can't do it. Okay, well we might even try and send a link to those. Yeah, I can do. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Help people can look it up. Uh, can HMRC distrain or issue walk-in possession agreement at the time of the unannounced visit? Uh, yes. Okay. Okay. Um, does HMRC? I care what you say here. Does, from NASA, does HMRC train its staff to push the boundaries in dealing with taxpayers? No comment. No comment. <laughs> All right. Okay. Did, did I? No comment. Yes. In terms of targeting particular trades, as I've said uh, and alluded to earlier, I totally get. The, the powers uh, and why they're needed for non-cooperative taxpayers. I saw that myself when I was in, uh, when I was a senior inspector in the Croydon office, and, and the frustrations that certain in, in investigators had with non-cooperative taxpayers. I understand and get the hidden economy cases where you want to go out and bring people back in, or people get people into the club, and the unannounced visits clearly. Uh, facilitate that and help you identify what their ca uh, tax position is. Uh, my, my, my big bugbear, and this is why I'm sort of championing uh, the unannounced visits, is the cash trades and how, in my view, they are being victimised. Um, 
the HMRC has dedicated joint working teams as, as we've explained and this one particular unit is something that if your client is involved uh, in hospitality or le uh, leisure industry uh, with cash, um, pubs, bars, uh, fish and chip shops, this one unit is on a crusade where they are going out into uh, fr the working Friday, Saturday evenings uh, and they are calling unannounced at business premises nationwide and this unit is feeding cases then into uh, a criminal uh, and also civil process. They're almost, it's a bit like, um, you know, excuse the pun fishing, they're out looking for cases and once they find it, find something and then referring it on for a compliance check or a criminal. So this is one unit that, you, that people really need to be alive to. It has been the case that, that when a visit ends, owner is not told of the findings, told HMRC will be in touch, um, and all cases are reviewed post-visit, uh, as I've j just uh, alluded to, for civil and criminal. Um, they're not, people aren't told that on the visit that information supply could lead to criminal uh, to a criminal case and the evidence be used against them. And there's been cases where, if we follow the process, an the visit has been authorised by an HMRC authorised officer, so not tribunal. It's then, we've there had the visit, we've then had uh, a criminal uh, registration, a criminal prosecution, and then ultimately confiscation of someone's assets. And all of that has come from an unauthorised, uh, an, unannounced, sorry, an unannounced visit by an authorised officer. A couple of case examples. Uh, ones in which I myself have been involved with. Uh, again, uh, a restaurant that was it was visited by the, the unit in Lincoln. Uh, 11 o'clock visit uh, on St. George's Day. Uh, the staff were, and that's the, and the word that was used to me, were, we were released by HMRC at 1.30 in the morning. The, now, there were admittedly some irregularities. Uh, and that essentially being uh, when certain number of covers were hit, uh, money w was a refund mode was entered onto the till, some money was taken out and it was put into the staff uh, cash tips. Um, we are talking uh, a maximum amount of about 30k uh, tax of all taxes over uh, the course of six years. The, because of what happened, uh, the taxpayer made a disclosure to HMRC within two days. Uh, immediately on Monday morning, when his accountant turned up, uh, he was there wanting to speak to the accountant and told the accountant what had happened. The accountant told him, wait till I, wait till I find a specialist to approach HMRC. The client was, was that keen to tell HMRC about what, what, what he'd been involved in and wanting to disclose that he made the disclosure himself. Now the disclosure was what we would call uh, correct, but it wasn't complete insofar as it didn't say to HMRC everything, but it said what he believed to be what HMRC was looking at. He didn't hear anything from HMRC, not even, even, even an acknowledgement of the disclosure. Six months later, he's visited and told to attend Custom House for an interview under a caution. The second case, Friday tonight, a uh, picture of the Mars bars was one of the novelty things about uh, this sh shop was kids could bring in whatever chocolates they'd want and he would fry them for them. Now this uh, this chip shop was a, f a family uh, Greek uh, owned uh, shop. Um, they were visited initially 2pm on a Friday during a very busy period. Uh, they cooperated with HMRC. Uh, and after an hour and a half visit, uh, they uh, waved goodbye to HMRC for them. that was the end of it. 11 o'clock that night, HMRC are back uh, to do a further cashing up uh, exercise. Now this case turned into, co into a code nine uh, and it ended up with an investigation into offshore activities because of their connections and because of some uh, assets owned uh, back in Greece and also it extended out into family members and predominantly both cases 
came because both owners believed that, that they had to allow and had to cooperate and allow HMRC entry. So, what to do when visited? Um, the key really for anyone is staying calm and taking control. Uh, it's imperative that the clients know what their rights are. Uh, if customers are on site, the immediate thing clearly is damage limitation. So is there somewhere that uh, HMRC will go in, they won't just go in one person, they'll go in literally with the five or the three uh, and be highly visible. So is there any way in which that can, the damage limitation can be, can be handled? Um, there's in, and it's important that the following processes are checked because we have seen instances where there's more officers that are on site than are actually on the notice. There's different names. You know, for example, Marjorie couldn't make it, uh, so uh, somebody else from HMRC turned, uh, attended in place. Uh, the times are different from what's actually on the notice. The dates are different. And also there's a concern in terms of how do you check identities, particularly when somebody's calling at 11 o'clock at night. How do, you, how do you check the persons or who they are, what they say they are, by speaking, to, phoning back and speaking to uh, HMRC or the authorising officer. But without question, the client must call you. The, 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 the client must refuse entry until such time as you uh, or an agent arrives. That is a uh, key. In terms of uh, what I call my five golden rules, in terms of what is reasonable and proportionate, but now this is particularly where for me, uh, the because a lot of a lot of what these five rules they would be, Kevin considered by the tribunal judge, so. For me, these are the questions that I, that I go through because this is the process by which the tribunal judge would apply. And I want to make sure that HMRC meets, uh, meets these standards and if they don't, then that would be reasons for me to uh, refuse them entry. So the dreaded not allowing the inspection to take place. Now, I have to say, this the the way in which the, the HMRC uh, and the, the the leaflets and the paraphernalia are about this, it's very difficult to actually pick this up, and uh, and that is 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 the way in which you you don't allow an inspection. You have to. It's imperative that you work that you calculate or you you uh, ascertain is it a tribunal issued one or is it an authorised officer issued one because your standards uh, and the way you respond have to be different. You, ha you have to understand that a tribunal judge has considered the case and deemed it reasonable. So therefore, for you, for you to then turn around and say it's not reasonable because you have no right of appeal, you only have what is called a reasonable excuse to, uh, for not allowing the inspection to take place. So it's, it's very important that that point is, is properly considered and put forward. The, because there is a potential penalty of £300 for further, and further penalties if uh, there's obstruction. But the obstruction has to be shown to be deliberate. So we've got a few questions there for catch up on. Uh, yeah. Is not allowing, is, is that your, you can't get hold of your accountant at the time a reasonable excuse that you want professional representation and they're denying it to you? Yes. Okay. Um, right, we've got a couple of specific ones here. A couple. Uh, are car dealers, hairdressers, or taxi drivers targeted? In your experience, car deal car dealers def uh, definitely. Um, the the thing about car dealers, uh, when I, when I was in HMRC, I actually enjoyed car dealers uh, because if you can get a car dealer to make admissions, uh, it, but they've always got an answer for for anything and. But in terms of in terms of them, why why would they do the unannounced visit? That prim primarily that would be to look at the assets and check the check the stock book. Uh, hairdressers, we have seen hair and health and beauty salons. We've seen them yeah. get the unannounced visits. Taxi drivers, not so much. Um, I would say more. I would say more the taxi firms, yeah, I mean, uh, as opposed to taxi drivers yeah. them, them, yeah. Them, themselves. We've actually had a claim this morning. I was reading where the 
a slight aside here, the taxi firms have been issued with a Schedule 36 notice to issue the revenue with details of all the jobs they're passing on to individual taxi drivers. Okay. Like cab call and whatever it's called. Um, right, we mentioned that the visits do need to be reasonably required. Do HMRC have to make any reparation afterwards for reputational damage? Uh, all HMR, the, the, one of the things that HMRC prior to the visit is they look at, uh, in many respects, they, their biggest concern prior to the visit is not the disruption, it's actually their own uh, health and safety. After the visit, all they have to do is, is confirm internally that, that there have been no uh, incidences of that nature. Uh, in terms of reputational uh, damage, uh, I'm not aware of any case where HMRC has accepted uh, any uh, fault or blame. Okay. Um, what sort of questions can be expected of a trader who's dealing mostly in cash? Is showing a cash book enough? Uh, they're interested in ca uh, cash handling, cash storage. H HMRC uh, hates cash. Uh, they, they view it as that there is easy scope for uh, misappropriation uh, uh, and so it wouldn't just sit literally be, I mean, as I've, as I've alluded, as shown earlier, they can't expect cash unless it's part of cash is the trading stock, but they will the way in which they'd ask the questions, it, the justification would be, or the way they deal with it, is that they've been invited. Right. Okay. It's not a case of that they've got a right, they've been invited by, they, they invite themselves to look at certain things, particularly with regard to the, the cash handling. Okay, thank you. Um, can HMRC go to someone's house on an unannounced visit just to collect the money and demand the check? Uh, no. Uh, well, the whole purpose of it, if we go back, the whole purpose of a, a, um, uh, of an inspection, it, it's to the, the three things would be to decide the correct tax position, decide how the person's tax position can be corrected, uh, and ensure that the correct tax is paid. So we're sort of dealing with the past as opposed to going there to demand payment. Question from Carolyn: uh, Our client went over the back threshold for a period of time. Disclosed this on his self-assessment tax return, which is when he discovered it in the white space box. Uh, the client then received an unannounced visit from HMRC of that officer asking to see all the books. When the client referred HMRC to us as accountants, he said that they weren't registered as agents on the 648 for VAT purposes. Uh, therefore, he couldn't ask for them to represent them. Um, is visiting a client who is not already registered for VAT normal practice rather than just waiting to ask? The information. Uh, yeah, it, the, I would I would definitely say the 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 the, unor, uh, the unauthorized visits, particularly by on the VAT side, is more proactive uh, on a case like that than it would be for direct tax. But as a general principle, HMRC cannot dictate who you wish to represent you, regardless no, of whether a sixty four eight is signed or not. Unfortunately, Kevin, for me, uh, no, that's not yeah. that is uh, that they can't do that. Yes. Huh? Yeah. So Graham from Wimbledon asks, if your client has an unannounced visit and you like to find under declared takings, are you better, from a penalty point of view, to approach them first or engage in the process when they respond to the visit? Uh, if if it was if you've had an unannounced visit, that unannounced visit has determined uh, cash diversions. That an HMRC has gone away with evidence of that. If the if the client has given untruthful responses or un, uh, or incorrect information to HMRC during the course of that investigation or during the check, if we believe that the uh, the misappropriations are of a deliberate nature, the the first port of call is is to apply for code nine. Okay. And get and get prote and get that client protection. The code nine is cases where they suspect there could be fraud involved. It, they, it is, uh, it, and this is the the thing that, that what what clients uh, one of the one of the the beauties about code nine is it's not just a case where HMRC suspects uh, fraudulent activity or deliberate behaviour. Uh, a taxpayer is perfectly within their rights to voluntarily request that, 
and by doing so gaining immunity for the for the matters in which they wish to disclose. How would you check an HMRC officer's identity if the visit was 11 o'clock at night? Who Correct. would you call? Uh, Ghostbusters. <laughs> uh, you, there is no one. That, that's exactly my point, Kevin. So that it would be one of, it would be a number of one of the grounds for actually uh, declining uh, that inspection. If a client has a shop that's trading and HMRC walk in, can we ask them to leave? Uh, yes, they've got uh, they've got no. Uh, it depends upon uh, obviously what they're in there for and the purpose of what what they're there for. Clearly, uh, if you've got a an, uh, they got there's certain rights that they have in terms of entering premises, but what they can't do is if they're if they're told to uh, go away, they can only then visit by way of uh, a tribunal notice. Okay. Uh... Can you give some examples of reasonable excuses for a number of these? Okay, we'll come on. We'll, we'll come okay. on. Um, okay, the case studies you quoted appear to demonstrate criminal or dishonest behaviour. Ethically, there's surely no excuse. If the visit was opposed, are we not condoning that behaviour? Now, what in the in the uh, in the, 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 the two instances, the, well, actually I've given three examples, Kevin. What, yeah. For the first one, there, were, there, there was absolutely nothing. I mean, we are talking minor adjustments. The second one, yes, we are uh, accepted there were some uh, uh, irregularities, but those irregularities that that particular person uh, attempted to disclose them. Um, what I'm not saying is I'm not for one minute condoning uh, criminal uh, behaviour, but what I am saying is that the that what taxpayers uh, are not uh, given the proper through this process the proper opportunity to essentially get their affairs in order if there are some irregularities um, and do so uh, without protection. How likely are oh, HMRC? Visit to check accountants' records, i.e., make an unannounced visit to an accountant. It it, it does it does happen. Uh, in particular, with regard to uh, where you've got a non-cooperative non, -co -co uh, non uh, taxpayer, for sure. Uh, but fundamentally, the uh, the unannounced visits are all about getting into the the business premises. Uh, that there, there are, you know, they've got they've got information power, separate information powers uh, to request uh, records from an accountant. They would only go into an accountant's uh, if they suspect that that, that, that accountant would be uh, obstructive or if there would be loss of paperwork. Okay, question from Julie: Would there be an issue with filming the visit? Uh, that's a good question. I've 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 never uh, come across. That uh, I think HMRC officers, if they were filmed, I think they'd be very quick to get off the premises. I have to, uh, I have to say. So we'll probably go back to the recording of meetings as well. Yeah, like you can if they give permission, but you can't without their permission. Yeah, and uh, I, uh, if somebody wanted to film them, I think it would ultimately lead to HMRC leaving the premises. Yeah. Okay. Um, Peter asks, can you call the police to eject HMRC? <laughs> If the taxpayer doesn't want them to come in, uh, well, what they should do is if you if you uh, deny them entry, if we go back to my seven sins, uh, they shouldn't uh, they shouldn't enter. So the re the reality is is uh, you know, they might stay outside for five minutes with a towel between their legs, but they should soon depart. So if you let them in and you subsequently decide, actually, I don't want you to remain, you can ask them to leave, and do they have to leave? Yes. Yes, you can, you can ask them to, uh, to withdraw. You mentioned about cashing up. They can only watch you cash up if it's in your normal business operations. Can they wait around for two to three hours to watch you cash up? Uh, they, that has happened. The, the, uh, there has been instances where somebody has said, uh, we, we cash up at a certain time, and then they stay in the restaurant. What rights do they have to remove records? Uh, they do have rights, and this is one of my biggest concerns, particularly re electronic records, is they uh, is they data download hard drives and walk out with 
private information, old records, because obviously a lot of people now have moved it on to electronic and they walk out with records going back beyond six years. So wouldn't a reasonable excuse, excuse be, I need to check those records before I give them to you? Correct. Yeah. Okay, do these visits have a result of no further outcome and no tax payable? Uh, yes, they do, uh, but HMRC would uh, would say that uh, that they would regard that uh, sort of uh, publicly as much as success, but uh, privately, uh, internally, statistically, they would be expecting yield from such a visit. Right. Okay. Now we've got about five minutes left, so we'll, we'll plough on out till the end. Okay. Um, the in terms of some of the reasonable grounds uh, for not uh, allowing the inspection to take place, clearly the five golden rules, as I call them, if that, if any of those, if HMRC cannot provide or cannot justify on, uh, in anybody's mind those uh, those particular areas, then I would uh, say, you know, so for example, if it doesn't, if it doesn't tell you what its risks are, if it doesn't say that. Uh, why it couldn't have done what it did with with an announced visit, uh, w and doesn't explain why it's reasonably uh, required, why it's chosen a particular time, particularly if it's late at night, uh, and why uh, the, they've uh, gone down the route of authorising officer rather than first tier tribunal, uh, because in the all the cases where we have did not, or we have said to HMRC, we are not satisfied that you have met uh, the, uh, the standards and therefore our advice to the client is for that for this inspection not to go ahead but yes HMRC you're perfectly entitled to go and uh, go to the tribunal in those cases not one have they gone to tribunal and we've been able to provide HMRC with the information it seeks alternatively So, in conclusion, uh, I would concur that the, that the powers are justifiable uh, for cases where there's non-compliance and com uh, combating uh, tax evasion, uh, particularly uh, hidden economy. Uh, they have to, HMRC has to show that the, such a visit is reasonably required and proportionate. Uh, one must understand the difference between a tribunal issued notice and an authorised issued authorising officer issued notice, because the, the huge difference is, is, and it's difficult to pick this out. But the truth is, non-compliance with a tribunal will lead potentially to a three hundred pound penalty. Non-compliance with an authorising officer issued uh, notice, and if, it, if this is the one thing to be taken away from uh, this presentation, is this tribunal. No right of appeal equals penal, a potential penalty. Authorising officer uh, issued by not denying them access, there is no penalty. So that says a lot in terms of why, why in law and why in practice an authorising officer issued notice can be rejected and there be no consequence of a financial nature. So the, it's, it's very important that people understand that and then Tell say to HMRC, fine. If you want to do an unauthorized visit, go to a tribunal. But we want to cooperate with you. Um, and obviously, uh, it, it's for my sense of purposes. And one of the things I'm trying to champion and get publicity on is the fact that particular trades are being targeted, and they are being, in my view, targeted unfairly with late night visits. And and people uh, and we're talking small businesses put under huge huge pressure uh, and, and there is a an emotional uh, impact uh, and a business impact you know uh, we had one guy who's one of his best clients was there customers was there and he witnessed HMRC coming in with a high in high visibility jackets it, it was just awful for him uh, and for that particular business so again it's one of the things that I'm attempting to champion at the moment Okay, thank you. Uh, a few last uh, points and questions uh, from Michael. The three hundred pound penalty is not a lot. Is it worth taking the penalty for peace of mind? Uh, you only get the penalty, obviously, on the tribunal one. Um, I think the one has to recognise that uh, 
the, the first tier tribunal judge for him to have been satisfied. I think in the ver in those sort of cases, and with my knowledge of what is going before the first tier tribunal, it is pretty much in cases where HMRC believes it's going to have or going to receive deliberate obstruction. So, but in the vast majority of the cases that, are, that I'm coming aware of, we are talking offer, authorised officer issued notices. No, yeah, no penalties. That's us as well with the, all of the ones we're seeing now are authorised officers. Um, then you've got to beg the question, why aren't they going to tribunal? Yes. Yeah. Um, although I'd have to say for me, I'd pay the £300. I wouldn't let them in, but that's just my personal opinion. Um, the inspector has uh, some examples here of visits. The inspector was allowed refusal as the client had young children and therefore it wasn't reasonable to expect them to come to the premises. Uh, I, I definitely, I'm aware of that for sure on uh, where they visit dwellings where they're, they're, there's a business run from a dwelling. Um, in terms of uh, the, if a proprietor has got children there, particularly if they're about to go home, etc. Then yes, that would be, uh, I think, I believe, sufficient grounds. But obviously, if we're, if we're talking about an authorising officer issued tri uh, notice, my view on those are wholly different from tribunal ones. As a general rule, in your opinion, um, rather than anything official. Is your advice, if it's signed by an authorised officer, to simply turn them away and say come back when it's more convenient? I would, I would say that in the vast majority of cases, or in all cases that we've been involved with, where we have gone through the five golden rules, HMRC has failed, Kevin. So therefore, based on that, on them not being able to justify it or satisfy myself, they've been rejected and in every instance they haven't gone to tribunal and we've been able to provide that information by alternative means. So it wouldn't be a case of simply rejecting it, I prefer my approach is to make HMRC f uh, not meet its own standards to my satisfaction, reject and then uh, pick up the pieces the next day in terms of cooperation. If Peter says he may be missing something but if HMRC must leave if requested, why does anything further happen? So, sorry, I'm not. If, if HMRC can be asked to leave, why does anything further happen? Of course, they're going to want to continue the compliance check. You won't. If you turn them away, it won't just finish there. They will come back, won't they? No, they will. They will come back. I mean, they will come back. It's just you then enter into dialogue as to how to continue with the inquiries. But the vast majority, for example, that Lincoln unit, go out and there's not even a compliance check. So they go out first. They then look to see if they're uh, and then. Uh, review the post visit and then decide what action and it's either compliance check or it's uh, potentially criminal on certain instances. Uh, and lastly, actually Marcy visit was scheduled, they came to ask how the business was run. Uh, they asked to com come back in, or they asked them to complete 30 days income and said we'll come back after 30 days. But instead they came for an unannounced visit two weeks later uh, and they came for three days. Does that sound right? Uh, no. Right. Uh, I'm interested in that one. Yeah. It was a week after, instead of 30 days, they came back after a week with an unannounced visit and stayed for three days. Okay, but well, I get the tactic of that. Potentially, uh, let's see what they've recorded for the last seven days and then let's go in and then see what the figures are compared to what they're recording. Yeah. Uh, but th that's the sort of cunningness that we are experiencing. Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, I would like to thank Mark for coming along today and imparting his knowledge. There's a lot to cover there in what is an interesting area and an area that practitioners are going to have to become much more versed in as the number of these visits increase and the connotations of these visits could be quite serious. Um, as I said, this is a number of uh, just one of our monthly webinars. Uh, if anybody has any comments, please do send them in. Uh, we will send out a copy of the slides. We will also, uh, Mark has promised, send a link to the compliance handbook identifying those golden rules. Some of you may want to put them into some sort of a, a newsletter. And I know at PFP we've written an article for firms to show to their clients. Uh, if anybody wants that, please get in touch. Lastly, I'm obliged, due to my sales director, uh, to plug our UK Tax Investigations Conference this year, 13th of October, 
anybody's interested in booking earlier, um, like now, please go online and do so. With that, um, thank you, Mark. No problem. Thank you very much. Um, we hope to speak to you all again soon, and I hope you have a good day.